here today to introduce Dr. Beda Han Houston from the World Health Organization, who's going to talk to us about the um, World Health Organization family of international classifications. And we're all pretty familiar with um, either the international classification of diseases or the international classification of functioning disability in health. So it's going to be great to hear a bit more about uh, what the WHO's work is currently in relation to those classifications and more broadly the, the family of international classifications. Um, just before I say something more about Bedahan, though, no, um, I just want to say welcome, <coughs> welcome to people from uh, who've come here from outside the institute. It's really nice to have a, a, a range of people come from other organisations and and good to see old friends here again. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge. Uh, Dr. Richard Madden, who's in the audience, and most of you will know that uh, Richard was a, is a former director of the Institute, so welcome back, Richard. Um, so Better Hahn is, I have just a few lines of biography here about him. He's worked in the, in the World Health Organization since, since 1990, first in mental health, then in the evidence cluster as an international health officer, and for multiple international networks on um, classification and assessment of health and disability, mental health epidemiology and primary care applications of classification training programs. And he's currently the coordinator of classifications, terminologies and standards at the WHO and leading the revision of the international classification diseases. He's the author and co-author of more than 200 articles and eight books. He's been awarded by the Turkish Scientific and Research Council, the Japanese government, uh, the American S Psychiatric Association and the British Royal College of Psychiatrists ha has awards from all of those organisations. So we're very lucky to have Betahan here and, and welcome. Look forward to hearing you hearing from you, Betahan. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, it's in, in fact, I am who's lucky being here among friends and this is basically 20th anniversary of my first visit to Australia. So every four or five years, I have the opportunity to come and visit your friends. And I always appreciated the input uh, that you as the collaborating center and the Australian colleagues made to the uh, classification network and to the family. Uh, and as uh, Leonard Cohen says, there's nothing like having sunshine and being among friends and having a captive audience <laughs> against winter blues, you know. <laughs> so in Northern Hemisphere winter, you know, it was very depressing days for ICD. So it, it also gives me a very good, uh, you know, hopeful uh, sunshine uh, for ICD revision and other projects. And I started with this slide to tell you about uh, WHO classifications. And when I was first uh, put in charge of classifications, it was 1998. And I was doing mental health, health services research, using classifications, of course, ICD, DSM, and applied for a directorship of mental health. But, you know, uh, although I got it, they didn't give it to me because of my nationality and so forth. Forget about this. So uh, kicking and screaming, I came in to, to direct the classifications program. They said, if you can classify mental disorders, you can classify possibly anything. <laughs> so at that time, I said, okay, the classifications are essential. They are the bu building blocks of infor health information. But as you can see today, I put a question mark to that. Are they, you know, building blocks of health information? In fact, they are building blocks possibly, as these, uh, you know, wheels indicate, but they, they have to be moving blocks as well of health information. They have to be dynamic and, you know, uh, and also like in a Swiss clock, they have to interoperate, you know, they have to fit together and these wheels, as you see, maybe do not. So. I'll try to tell you three stories all in one. So this is a new slideshow of three uh, different slideshows, and I always add new slides to it, so it's not one of my canned shows. Uh, and I would like to share with you as colleagues the vision, whether we can create something interoperating or interdigitating so that all these wheels, you know, not necessarily seamlessly, but possibly you know, harmoniously work together. So I would very much appreciate your feedback at the end and any time during the uh, presentation, feel free to ask questions. 
So when I inherited the family, and I was working on ICD, and then we had just more or less in the final stages of ICF, which I believe everybody knows a bit, and I will tell you uh, a short story for all of these, uh, ICD, ICF. And at that time, we were also planning, contemplating uh, to see whether we can have a health intervention classifications as well. So this was the family picture. For those of you who want to learn more, some five years ago or four years ago at the University of Sydney, I, I gave a lecture, so it's still on their website, you know, about the family. Wh what do you call a family? And it was at that time I was going, it's not the Sicilian family that's run by, you know, uh, uh, mafia or other type of family descriptions, but it is more or less a suite of integrated products. And in our family, there are derived classifications because none of these reference classifications are when you try to apply in a setting are fit for purpose. So people need to, for example, if you want to apply it to oncology, want to make more detailed classifications or uh, psychiatry or dentistry, although you have 32 feet, they have a huge classification of 320 pages. So <laughs> uh, front piece, side piece, and so forth, of each teeth, gums, and so forth. Then there are also related classifications. They are the cousins and, you know, uh, of the main classifications. And the family is large, but what is, it, what, what is the main genetic element that brings them together is the key question. And uh, Jenny being the head of the family development committee and f uh, Richard being the former uh, head of the development committee, Australians have a good uh, basis foundation in defining the elements of the family. And uh, it is very important to define the family and make it hold together. So. At that time, uh, when we had the ICD, ICF, and ICHI as classifications, they are very much used, and many of you use it in your AIHW work and you know, uh, health information work for defining population health, the counting births, deaths, diseases, disability, and risk factors. And clinicians use it knowingly or unknowingly in one way, and we capture their you know, decision support, integration of care, care outcome. Administration is the biggest thing, you know, for, if you see, for resource mobilization, scheduling, billing. And, of course, in terms of reporting, costs, needs, and outcomes refer to these building blocks all the time. And we were, at that juncture, confronted by the invasion, if you will, uh, of the electronic health record systems coming up to a theater nearby you. It was over-promising and under-delivering in the last two decades, but they are going to come and, uh, you know, seize the picture no matter what, because this is a huge sector of computation and economy, if you will, that could not be left to doctors or health information managers alone. I mean, that is 15% of the healthcare expenditure, 30% of the informatics world cannot be left alone to, to you know, people who want to play with computers. So the, the model that we wanted to build was some sort of integrated terminologies, which is basically what people use as controlled vocabularies or you know, standardized terminologies. But the most important thing here is the keyword here you know, you health information managers use mappings. I, I detest that term, I'm sorry. And I, I call it as uh, knowledge representations in the informatics world, and I'll ex explain that. Really to have what that knowledge is represented as rather than all these mappings. And link it to, of course, to classifications. So with that, there is a analog world, if you will, <coughs> like this, and this might be Jenny or Richard, you know, in front of the Australian, uh, you know, health and welfare scene, and you can put all the uh, information rubrics onto a whiteboard, but then you have to really identify them digit by digit, you know, unit by unit, and computerize them and put them together, and that is how maybe the wheels that the primary care physicians, oncologists, 
or mortality experts that they have done fit for purpose can work in their own setting, but be brought together, how do they fit each other in an overall digitized system? So the transformation from analog to digital is our mission, and that is, that is the backbone of the story. And how do we achieve that? So this, the issue here is that, let me also tell you another thing which you may or may not know. Of course, I will tell you about the ICD revision as an example, and defining health and disability in ICF, uh, second part of the story or third, and the health interventions, uh, which we had made a business plan uh, and called it Mission Impossible, and it is becoming Mission Possible. Mr. Phelps had given us a small tape, which destroyed itself after five minutes, if you have watched that. <laughs> and then Richard and his team carried out some certain things, and in the final act, you know, me acting like Tom Cruise, I would say, uh, we brought some sort of funds. <laughs> Now, joke aside, uh, the novelty in all this is the digital production. And if you want to uh, learn more about this, the key word is ontology. And I will tell you more about that. It's not the word, but the concepts, uh, which is important. And how do, we, uh, how do we make it use? Now, I can sit down in a monastery in the, in the Alps and make this all on my own in my ivory tower. And with my friends, I can do that. But it, is, it really doesn't hold, okay? And basically, it is not whether you develop a refined system. It was the 15th century, 16th century way. Maybe 20th century way was some sort of having it made in the meetings. But currently, what is more important is that the information blocks that you make is appropriated, owned uh, by the masses. So. What we do is that the key element is how can we collaborate with you? So the most important thing is not the method. The most important thing is the participation of you or the collaboration with you. And the Time magazine every year uh, chooses the person of the year. And in 2006, they had chosen you, you know, as the person of the year. In the information age, you control the information age. Welcome to your world. So. We do want part of you, you know, doing your own work, but the other part is collaborating to the, you know, commons-based uh, production in the internet. Be it may be in LinkedIn, Facebook, or other type of things with these collaboration tools to make it happen. So I'll tell you that story. Let's go a little bit back, okay? I think you being part of the Commonwealth uh, are very uh, familiar. Uh, about the London Bills of Mortality. In London parishes, they were the pastors or other clergy were the first health information managers. <laughs> and they went uh, knocking on the doors of the households and asked who died in the household in the last year and what was the reason. And they had this 132 uh, items struck by a lightning, found dead on the street, but you know, plague and other things. So you can read about that. And at the end, the registrar compiled this uh, report that was a precursor of Richard and Jenny, you know, <laughs> and then uh, issued the bills of mortality. And this 132 items was the first ICD, if you will, <laughs> or the national classification of London modification of ICD. <laughs> okay, and since then, it has passed 350 years. And if you look at this 350 years over the time course, you see this. Here you see the ICD versions. And before ICD-1, it started with Farr and Despin, and then 40 years later with Bertillon. And it was 1900 that first ICD-1 was produced, not with a big bang, you know, but you know, we, we just put the mark at the beginning of this 20th century. And at that time, as you can see on the uh, y scale, this is the number of categories per ICD revision, uh, and that is in a logarithmic scale, as you can see. And the first ICDs were no different than the London Bills of Mortality, 130, 190, maximum 200 something. And the big change came in ICD-6. At that time, the World Health Organization was founded, and the International Statistical 
Institute handed the uh, international classification to WHO. And the member states of WHO asked WHO to include morbidity, a very ill-defined term, but what they wanted is that for p not only the causes of death, but also the hospital admissions statistics about that could be coded. So guess what? From 200s, we, we reached the level of, you know, the thousands, from 954 to 1,164. Now, when we issued the ICD-9 in 1975, Americans and later on Australians too felt that for hospital admissions and uh, morbidity purposes, that that was not detailed enough. As, as a classification expert, I divide the world into two, big picture guys and detailed lovers, detailed lovers. So many clinicians love the detail and then came the clinical modifications, ICD-9-CM, and ICD-9-CM immediately ha hit the bar for 10 thousandths. And you Australians, I believe, uh, used the ICD-9-CM for two revisions and then said that, well, this is too American, let's make the Australian version. <laughs> and then you have been doing this for nine times, I believe ninth edition will be coming in. And your, your mortality had started in, uh, 1907. So you have been doing the whole journey, uh, you know, for more than 100 years for mortality. And with ICD, uh, well, I would say 11 times you have revised it. So in a sense, when we are going to history as a country, you have a very long track record and we have a lot to learn from you. And one of the things this afternoon we are going to discuss with the advisory committee of classifications, how can we benefit from your experience and build a common future together. Because what we are doing has to be fit for purpose for the future, and it's important how we can <coughs> achieve that. So we have a multi-purpose uh, classification, and then we were revising the ICD. Uh, you know, it had to be revised in 2000. So let me be very clear about this. And I was brought into the job in 1998. There were two years ahead of me to revise the full ICD-10 to 11. I said, that is, that is ridiculous. And thank God there was a famous Y2K, you know. <laughs> Everybody was amazed and scared and so forth. I used the scare factor around Y2K and asked for a moratorium and said that, you know, it be whatever we do, nobody will apply it. And already the WHO produces these things and member states implement them at their will, you know. They don't automatically switch to the latest version themselves. Look at Americans, they haven't still got onto ICD-10 yet in, in their clinical modifications. So they take their time. The second thing, of course, the third thing, sorry, was that, well, we have 194 member states now, then it was 189. Only 192 uh, were reporting to WHO using ICD, although there is an international treaty that obliges all member states to report their official statistics to WHO using ICD. It was agreed in 1969 It's the first international health regulations. But it doesn't have teeth. It, you know, if they don't do anything, we don't go and collect it ourselves. So that, is a, that was the reason for moratorium. And then we developed a very full-fledged revision plan. And we put these goals at the beginning. First of all, ICD is a multi-purpose classification. Okay, it was it has this heritage of you know mortality since London bills of mortality, but there is also morbidity, primary care, little as, as you know in this country there are enclaves of ICPC and so forth, and clinical care research, but mostly public health. But there must be a consistency and interoperability across different uses because. Well, people were making ICPC to ICD maps, and then we were spending three years to validate them and so forth. So how do you maintain a system that is consistent and interoperable? And of course, I mean, you are fortunate to speak a common language with the Anglophone world, but you may wish to know that even the first six ICDs were first produced in French, then translated to English. Now, th there is a switch, you know, 
uh, Anglophone depend, you know, uh, dominance, but still we have ICD in 41 languages. So when you go to countries, it serves as a multilingual reference standard. So the code is language independent as a concept. So for scientific comparability and communication purposes, it's important and it's becoming more important in a global world because Australians are traveling everywhere, right? But those are the two, uh, how do you say, permanent goals of ICD revision. If you look at the documentation, I read through all the revision documents through the archives, they are more or less stated in similar uh, terms as uh, revision objectives. But the third one we added new, that's why I highlighted in uh, yellow, that is, well, there is a digital revolution and we should make sure that ICD-11 should operate in an electronic format. Of course, people were taking the lists and putting up web pages and other things, but even we didn't, WHO did not display ICD-11 on a website at that time. So we wanted to make sure that ICD-11 will be a digital product, but not only that, it should interoperate in an electronic health record environment and information system, say with Tsunami at CT and you know, gene ontology and other things, and there should be a computational machine processable uh, base for that. And that was a very ambitious and noble goal, and that is, uh, that, that still drives us. But uh, the first time I had, I was in WHO, it was 1987 September, I remember it like this, and somebody in the corridors of WHO grabbed me, well, you speak good English, we need you, and that was a, a country I know best. You, you refer to your own country like this now, WHO, because we are international civil servants, we don't name them. And the delegation said that, uh, you know, uh, we don't have anybody like you, and that was the ICD revision conference. I went into the room, it was like this, you know, there were committees in small uh, rooms, and everybody was some sort of horse trading lists. There was a very strong Canadian, Australian, and US delegation. All the rest were some sort of cousins and you, you know, remote relatives of the ministers of health. And they were saying yes, 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 and <laughs> so forth. At any rate, you know, ICD-10 was built behind closed doors by horse trading lists. And there was a decibel method of discussion, who spoke highest, most eloquent, you know, <laughs> Uh, carried the day. And secretaries typed the lists at the end. There was a, you know, a witty uh, rapporteur. And then next morning, we gave them again to the participants, and everybody went through that with a red line. And then uh, overnight, index was not there. It was all produced in English. That was the method. Now we said, look, this cannot be maintained or, you know, I mean, under 20th, 21st century. So we said, we are going to have an uh, international <coughs> web platform that is open three, 365, 24, seven. Everybody could participate. And my poster child of example uh, comes from this country, you know, Professor Barry Marshall, who discovered helic Helicobacter pylori. In the archives in 1987, again, there is a letter uh, citing his Nature article saying that, that uh, we should classify Helicobacter-induced peptic ulcus as an infectious disease. And of course, these people did not understand that, okay? <laughs> Ignored it. And to tell you the truth, sadly, WHO, with my efforts after four or five years, URC adopted helicobacter-induced uh, pepticulcus in 2011. Five years later, uh, Professor Marshall got the Nobel Prize. So th the system was not evidence-based or science-driven. It was just consensus-based by experts. And you know, consensus is you know, agreement by misunderstanding, and experts have their you know, 30 years back their knowledge. So today's ICD-10, sadly, I don't want to denigrate our own standard, has the scientific basis of 1980s knowledge. So we really have to upgrade that and be really engage with the clinical teams. And you have been doing in Australia with the AM, consulting with the clinicians and so <coughs> forth, they publicly submit things. But WHO started that process as your update revision process in 98 only. And you know, we were just 
fiddling but the edges you know not dealing with the essential components and that was the difficulty so we, we really uh, tried to bite the bullet and do the difficult way so what we started is creating uh, something that we call is a foundation component first of all we said we are very respectful of the legacy the historical trends and every you know the time series have to con continue and we co we did something which we call ICD 10 plus and we requested each country like Australia Canada Germany others to give their national modifications and we put them in and but also we asked clinicians what are the clinical categories that you use because we are going to build a digital library for those of you who have iPhones or other Android devices you put all your music onto this but then you create playlists right so the mp3s or whatever format you record is the foundation component okay it's a store of all the digital books now how you display your books in a digital library or an actual library how do you shelve them depends on the purpose so depending on the purpose you can create what we call is a linearization it's a made-up word uh, computer nerds use it it is basically a code set if you will or a classification if you will okay uh, but since we use the classification for ICD we, we, want, we needed to specify that linearization is a subset of that it is a foundation component fit for a particular purpose it is jointly exhaustive and mutually exclusive so and each I, I entity is given a single parent because as you know statisticians don't want to double count things so if you're counting diabetic retinopathy you know it's either a form of diabetes you know endocrine disease or eye disease you don't need to count it twice so basically for example the example is that neoplasms etiologically are always counted in the oncology chapter of tumors and but well, dermatologists were always saying that malignant melanoma is also a skin disease. Now, if you have it in a digital environment, you can have this song in two different playlists. You know, it can be put under neoplasms and under skin as well. I hope I am clear about this. I am caricaturizing somewhat, but I think that's the utility. And, of course, two more difficult part is that we came into some sort of database management, relational databases, okay, semantic media wiki and Wikipedia, other type of thing. But eventually, we use something that computer scientists call ontology. And of course, there is not a single uh, agreed definition of ontology. That's why being a psychiatrist and having a license for neologism, I invented the term ontology. I don't care what it is. I'm simply saying that it is not the ontology that you have read in high school in philosophy uh, relating to Aristotle or Sartre in being a nothingness. But ontology in computer science, they say, well, this is a glass of water. Okay? A glass of water is an entity. And the, the attribute is that it is made of glass. It's a cylindric cup. Okay? It holds water. So the entity is defined as such with its attributes as glass, cylindric, and so forth. The values is, you know, whether this is big, small, you know, the diameter, and so on. So as such, the computers, the stupid computers, can learn what an entity is. It defines a common vocabulary, and between software, they can exchange this meaning. So if computers can exchange meaning, more intelligent humans can also do so if you want to do it like this, we thought ontology will be a good way. And I think this proved right because then, well, I mean, of course, still people argue about things, but we are getting more and more precise definitions of disease. By the way, ICD is the classification of diseases, but it had never defined what a disease is. <laughs> so if you wish, we can, we can go in that path as well. We define that. But the good thing about having an ontology then we built something called ICAT. ICAT is a web uh, platform, stands for International Collaborative Authoring Tool for ICD Revision. And it's open, web-based. It's like Wikipedia, if you will. You know, everybody can contribute. But in Wikipedia, you write more or less into an uh, empty page. Here, you have to write into a 
table that is a pre-formatted by WHO and use the content model, which I'm going to show you in a minute. And of course, what you write has to be edited by others. Wikipedia is no editorial oversight. You know, we have scientific peer review and topic advisory groups looking over these things. And this is the content model. I mean, we define the disease like this. And if you look into that, the green top titles were already in ICD implicitly, t in ICD-10. Everything had a title, everything had a classification property, some terms of inclusion and exclusion, and some sort of a body site description, uh, probably a causal property, temporal property as, you know, acute, chronic, and some sort of severity property, and sometimes diseases that apply to men only, women only, children only type of things, and treatment properties such as, you know, uh, antibiotic resistant tuberculosis or uh, treatment resistant depression, so forth. But we also added something textual definitions. Although mental health, sleep disorders, neurology, and some rheumatologic disorders and endocrine disorders or anemia have definitions in ICD, we said that everything should have a definition. And from that, we added some manifestation properties because we wanted to use this as in the future as a decision support tool as well. And we also merge ICF functioning properties. ICD had information about, for example, blindness, deafness, or you know, difficulty in walking and other things. And some parts of ICD had diagnostic criteria. So as you can see, this, this was a systematic effort to define the categories of ICD. And in a relational database, we built those things in. And eventually, we, we produced something called ICD alpha, which you may have seen, and then ICD beta, like software, you know, beta software you use as is, you know. Uh, and this has the look and feel of the ICD-10, but underpinning in it, it, there is an ontology with the foundation component. And the volume that you see as ICD beta is a uh, volume one of ICD-10 equivalent, which is now called the joint linearization for mortality and morbidity. Let me tell you what it is. From the foundation, we created like classical ICD, mutually exclusive and jointly exhaustive sets, sets which we call Merge principle, so that there is no double counting and all categories are in, and we created residuals. And we took the foundation uh, and find the terms from SNOMED or ICF, and we, for example, created different linearizations for mortality, morbidity, or primary care. And we allowed multiple parenting, like pneumonia could be a lung disease, and not always a lung disease because you can have some pneumonia, let's say by inhalation or some uh, you know, ingestion of liquids and so forth, uh, like chemical pneumonia. And we built these, this joint linearization. For people who are traditionalists, they only want to see this. Several categories listed, one about the other. But we wanted to put some sort of an aggregation up that rolls up to a primary care version or an intermediate version and possibly a short version that includes verbal autopsy. And there may be a fourth version that can include the extensions like Australian national modification or specialists like dentistry, like neurology, like mental health. So in a sense, we call this a digital telescoping, or some people call it Russian dolls. That's also fine. But basically, if I were to look at the Google Maps or any other digital map, between Geneva and Sydney or Canberra, I can look at it. But if you go from in Sydney, you look at like this. If you go in you know, more detailed street map. So this is basically a digital zooming and zooming out principle. If you identify the granular elements, then depending on the relationships among them, you can digitally set your zoom filter at any given level. So that is the benefit of a digital infrastructure plainly put. And the example of it, for example, in primary care, you can have cataract and you can say, you know, senile cataract and, you know, 
maybe in a, a, an early cataract as well. In the joint linearization, you can ha have some sort of mature or coronary and so forth. But ophthalmologists have, I mean, this is not uh, exhaustive, 39 different flavors of cataract and all these congenital ones and other things and so forth. So you can see that. Now, let me tell you some other things. This is a real code, and uh, maybe some of you are already familiar with it. And the Americans are an interesting uh, nation. They always all make fun of themselves. And this is a book which is called ICD-10 Illustrated, you know. <laughs> uh, and it says, passenger in heavy transport vehicle injured in collusion with pedal cycle in a traffic accident subsequent encounter. I mean, my cognitive test strategy is that can I repeat this code without looking at it? I never could. I mean, this is the nth time I'm making this presentation. I was unable to memorize it, okay? And of course, when you look at this, in ICD-9, there were 80 codes of bicycle accidents, and in ICD-10, it became more than 580 in pieces. But all you make look at it is that you hit possibly 10 things, you can have five roles for the injured, five activities when injured, and two contacts, whether you're in traffic or not in traffic. I mean, that is the gist of it. So why make your life complicated, okay? You can make a very intelligent coding scheme with the computers, you know, it's almost like a, you know, a Chinese menu of type of things. So this is the organization principle, you probably know it. In library sciences, when you're developing an index, there is a principle that's called pre-coordination. So you put the fixed names like this, pedal cycles injured in collision, that's the long-winded thing. And post-coordination is that you code the stem, like bicycle accident. Okay, we know it's bicycle accident. Okay, what did the bicycle hit? The wall, the car, another human being. What was the role, you know, was it a official and so forth? What was the context in traffic and so forth? What was the activity? Was it a, you know, this and that? So you can post-coordinate it. But here you definitely, you know, get the bicycle accident, you know, what matters most first, and then all the rest second. And this was important because I tell you, I mean, I'm all, of course, in the digital age, I put alerts for ICD-10 related news, I get you know, at least 20 or so uh, ICD news per day through different things. And one day, boom, there was an alert from Wall Street Journal. I said, ICD Wall Street Journal? There must, there, there we must have something, you know, Americans must have done something funny again. And indeed, uh, Wall Street Journal uh, computer experts had written a small Java applet. You can go to this website and say that basically, they say things that bite, struck by, and then put the value sets for dangerous encounters with turtles, chickens, macaws, hidden perils from opera houses, lampposts, mobile homes, injured when you're water skiing or crocheting and so forth. So basically, I mean, in ICD-10 CM, they have pre-coordinated everything, and ICD-10 CM has arrived in 179,000 codes. And that's all pre-coordinated. Now, you are dealing with health information. I mean, is this the right way to go? I don't think so, but I mean, that of course put me in the, at odds with my American colleagues. But what we are opting heavily is a post-coordination mechanism which goes with some sort of codes. And therefore, we created something called X chapter in ICD-11, saying that how can we master this explosion with X files, and these are called extension codes. So type one extension codes, I mean, we also put English names, but even English with, that's separated by a common language do not agree on the term of qualifier, modifier. These are basically qualifier or modifier, but I don't use them. We use them as type one, type two, type three, because n numbers are different than each other. In type one, we put in all the uh, qualifiers of a disease, okay? 
basically severity, temporality, etiology, anatomic detail, histopathology, and so forth. And in type two, we use your flags. I think in Australia, we call, call them flags. Whether this was the main condition, present on admission, what's the provisional diagnosis, diagnosis confirmed by a lab test, and whether this was a rule out or a differential diagnosis. And type three is different. Basically, is it a family history or history, or is it f f uh, a screening or evaluation of? Because ICD has been used in different contexts. You don't need to use all the extension codes, but this gives you an, uh, uh, I would say, a vocabulary or some sort of opportunity for expressivity. And you can use these multiple codes either as a cluster style, so you can put code one, code two, code three, and then at the end, the numbers one, two, three as a clustering indicator. Or you can put this in a chain style, code one slash code two slash code three, so that you can go like this. It doesn't matter because in a STEMI posterior for wall uh, MI confirmed by ATG, could be written like this as an example, you know, one being the clustering in encounter, and this is the code now, and this is the X chapter edition, or you can do it like the web pages do, you know, edit at the end as an affix. I mean, depending on your health uh, information system infrastructure, these two codes are isomorphic, you know, they are the same, they, they render the same meaning, doesn't matter, but you have the richness of expressivity. And we don't increase the number of codes. We still are at the magnitude of 15,000 now in ICD-11. But with post-coordination, the expressivity is equivalent to a million, if you will. So, and not everything is applicable to everything, as you can see, uh, imagine. So the second part, I'm, I'm uh, aware of the ta time, but uh, I will quickly say that we are now, I would say, 90, 95% done with ICD fixing, and next month we are going to have a meeting in the final 5 to 10% of the remaining codes in Geneva. And after that, whether we agree or disagree on those final 10%, we will issue a frozen version and go to the field tests. And with this field test, we want to seek the issues around applicability, reliability, and the utility of the classification. By applicability, is it easy to use? Is it reliable? Do two different persons like Wiki and you know Carrie, do they use the ICD-11? The same patient, same codes, or same record, same codes. And utility is that, well, what is the benefit from this? You know, what's the added value of ICD-11 over 10? Do you do it qu quicker? Do you do it you know, better? And so forth. And those are the questions I'll go quickly. And basically, we would like to do this in mortality, morbidity, quality and safety, and other uses, and in primary care, general health care, and research settings. And basically, this is the inter-rated reliability. I already said, you see a patient or look at the health, health record and code it between t at least two different coders, and do you, do you measure the agreement rates? That's one thing. And I think we will ask the Australian Collaborating Centre to seek for you know, uh, types of participants for that. And the second thing is that bridge coding. What do you call it in Australia? That is some sort of like you did already from 9 to 10. Do you call it bridge coding or cross? Coding. Dual coding. Dual coding, yes, sorry. It's the same thing as you have already done, so I, you, know, you know it better than us, so you can guide us there. And the timeline is that now in March we are going to have the field trials version, and we will keep it in field trials at least two years. And then in 2017 we'll go to the World Health Assembly and they will approve it, hopefully. And what we say is that since this is a very heavy mechanism that we have done. After that, we are going to hand it over to the update and revision committee. But each year, their annual updates should follow the same example, so that we will call ICD 2017, 18, 19 consecutively, like this, so that each year in October we freeze it, and in, as of 1st of January, there is a release like this. It will be a public good. I am advocating a mechanism that WHO charges nobody, including commercial users of ICD, and it should be for free for all users. But, you know, I, I need to win that game. 
and it should be definitely available in multiple formats as printed book, but internet edition and computerized tools. Uh, tools. And if I summarize the ICD-11 thing is that, as you have heard, formerly it was the annual revision conferences, everybody coming into a meeting room and agreeing on a, a code set. Now it is a continuous web platform and meetings. Each one has its pros and cons. And I think we also need annual revision meetings. And the focus on ICD-10 was only on mortality statistics and morbidity was slowly gaining in. But now we are focusing on all statistical use cases. I mean, we have a quality and safety group now trying to make, for example, quality and safety indicators part of ICD. And I think it's much better than having a segregated classification. As you can, as I told you, it was produced manually. Now we are producing digitally with an information model. And I think the amount of uh, consultation power that has gone to this information model is immense. I mean, no single country would have done that. And over seven years, we have really engaged the be best minds of this world. It was produced in English. I can tell you that already it is ready in 80% in French, 40% in Chinese, and we have a translation memory, and we are developing multilingually. There were no field tests whatsoever for ICD-10 before its adoption. Some people did the dual tests and so forth, but after the adoption. And there was no update mechanism. We could only do it thanks to Rosemary Roberts and others. You know, eight years later it is. Uh, but now we have a continuous update mechanism, revision mechanism built in. Now I'll give you a small three-minute stories about ICHI and ICF, if I'm not going to bore you. But the gist of the story is that as they say, once you have a hammer, everything to you seems like a nail, okay? And, uh, you know, uh, in CERN they say that once you have a collider, everything looks like a p particle. <laughs> so, well, guess what? Now that we have ontology, everything to us is simple. We will ontologize the interventions. We need intervention classifications. I don't need to the preach to the choir. I mean, you already have an uh, Australian ACHI, and you gave it as a donation, as a gift horse, but we looked into the mouth and circulated uh, to two, uh, 194 countries. Only six of them were interested, and none of them wanted to buy ACHI block structure as their national classification. But Richard Madden did not uh, give up, and he developed a new ICHI, H alpha 2. And what we are going to do is that, let me just pass quickly. I was looking for money. I said, R Richard, it's very good, but it cannot be done on volunteer effort. And after so many, knocking on so many doors, AMA uh, said that, well, we do need this ontology approach, and I convinced them about the ontology approach. So we are going to merge and sort AMA CPT with Ichi alpha 2. and we are planning to finish it by 2018 as a sister classification to ICD. Uh, we are very close to finalizing this deal with them. I mean, several Northern American colleagues said that you are selling your spirit to Saturn, your Dr. Faust and so forth. But anyway, uh, I said, well, I mean, poor people do not have choices, you know. <laughs> uh, but I think we have, we have really uh, garnered a good system there, so there will be an itchy. Now, I will, sh I will finish with ICF. I stole this slide from the World Bank president, Jim Kim. He was once upon a time in WHO. In fact, this slide doesn't abide with WHO ethical principles because it displays a patient. But I changed his name, Joe, okay? This is Joe in January, and this is Joe in October, okay? in 2003, and Jim Kim was at that time was in WHO uh, promoting three by five. He was there to give three million HIV patients treated by 2005. Okay. I write ICD-10 codes, okay? B24, HIV disease, okay? Right, Vicky? <laughs> Fine. And then 10 months later, Joe has still got the same disease, no change. Once you have HIV, you're lifelong HIV, okay? And ICD cannot differentiate. But if you add ICF information, 
Joe couldn't move around, could not wash himself, could not go to school. And Joe, almost fully functional, but he had some moderate participation restriction in higher education because he was, he was going to go to college and because of his HIV status, some colleges rejected his application. So ICF yielded very useful information from a psychosocial perspective. I don't need to preach to the choir. I mean, I think there are very many interesting training materials on ICF, but ICF is a classification on disability and health, and that gives you a better in-depth knowledge as to what people can do, cannot do, may you know, do as a, in their current environment uh, with regard to their disease or health condition. So diagnosis is useful, but disability adds a better information and formulation of caseness. And I have a proof for that. So you have these famous DRG groupings, case mix groupings, you put diagnosis, procedures, comorbidity, age, gender, or other complexity elements. So you have your famous ARDRGs and their you know, complexity uh, formulas. And I tell you, if you add, you know, they predict some sort of length of stay costs, hospital mortality, discharge, destination, one year mortality, and so forth. There are, there's a lot of information on that. But we did something more on this. And then we put functional information coded according to ICD, look, length of stay prediction ra uh, raised from 13% to 19%, from 8% to 28%, and this is in three different places, Singapore, Hong Kong, and uh, UK. Uh, and those are the costs, hospital mortality, discharge de destination, and one-year mortality. This was presented as a poster in South Africa with an intern of mine. Now she's making her PhD on this very topic, and she's about to finish it and will publish it as well. But what I'm saying is that diagnosis is useful, fine, but is not sufficient to predict the outcomes. And ICF adds some sort of additional perspective for that, and you will be you know, foolish not to use it, if I may say so. And so what we are also trying to do is develop a ICF ontology so that we have a common structure and reporting method so that from electronic health records, because clinicians already use that language, but they are not aware that they are speaking ICF. So we can extract that information from electronic health records and use it. So let me end with this, that you know, whether you use a sand clock, an analog clock, or a digital clock, it doesn't matter. You're talking about the time. What matters is what you do with your time Basically, we are all trying the same thing, the cartoon says from The New Yorker. And yes, but we really have to make them work together and make it worth. Thank you. Thanks very much, Peter Han. Uh, you're happy to take a couple of questions? Oh, yeah. Or, yeah? I mean, sorry, I've, I've been long-winded and s put so much time, but it's just okay. There's sure. lots to say. Questions? Comments? Kerry? Right. I'm, I'm currently, I mean, we, of course, uh, in my approach, we did the ideal solution and then, you know, worked on it for the seven years. As of last 12 months or so, we are doing something that Jenny knows, what we call is the transition study. And the transition study is uh, focusing on the current situation in countries and what it takes for them to switch to ICD-11, okay? So basically making some sort of the expected versus observed difference and what it will take. Now, in some countries they are very, very, uh, you know, hopeful that they will use ICD-11. And basically the countries that have invested on, for example, IHD, STO, to tsunami, CT, they will get much more return on their investment if they use ICD because we are, I don't tell you, but we are linking this to Sonomet CT with knowledge representation, not necessarily with the mapping, which is much more detailed and so forth. So for those countries, including Australia, and we will discuss it with the advisory group, I see that there is a high probability strata. Now, there are some countries who are, I mean, this is a, 
this is a how novelty seeking you are as a country inform, you know health information system or how traditionalist are they i mean the dutch for example say that oh we won't move an inch in a stubborn way until we see that it works i mean f at least for mortality but you know the dutch did not even implement the icd10 updates because they think that updates are some sort of a heretic thing to for continuity so Italy is doing a 10 IM, and they are very also friendly. Sweden is very friendly. S but Americans have invested so much on 10 CM, they want to have a, have a path, first 10 CM, then 11. But there is a group in US, they say that let us leapfrog 11. Um, well, I don't know, and one, intermediary solution, if I may use that term, is that produce ICD-10, retrofit ICD-10 CM in ICD-11 foundation, because it's already there, and put this digital wine and label the bottle as ICD-10 CM, so that they can have their wine and drink it too. Thank you. Thank you.